Hello, and thank you for joining us. My name is Molly Carmichael, with Zonda's Inspirational Leadership Series, joined by the industry's best in real estate. And today, we are joined by Ross Burrow, Jr. Ross and many of these great leaders are responsible for designing and developing the communities we live in today and for many generations to come. It is staggering when you think about the long-term contribution of these great leaders. This series is about who they are, how they got started, their inspirational leaders, and their journey to the top. Before we begin, today's podcast is sponsored by American Ventures. A huge thanks to American Ventures. Sponsors like them make this series possible. Welcome to American Ventures. We are a multifamily and commercial real estate investment company focused on new development and value-added real estate investments. We are focused in Texas real estate. On our recent exit, our investors earned a return on investment of 1.81x multiple after one year, one month hold period. Our upcoming investment is a 100-acre urban community in Austin Metro, and we are raising capital now. Invest with American Ventures. For more information, email us, invest at AmericanVentures.com. Now let's get started. I am thrilled to share today's interview with Ross Bro Jr. And while Ross Bro Jr. has a huge legacy of his own, many of you may also know him by his father, Ross Bro Sr., who ran for president in 1996 against George Bush and Bill Clinton. His father was also a huge leader in technology. Well, many of you may know that EDS formed in 1962. It's well before the greats like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. And in fact, You'll hear a little bit about this in the interview. Ross Bro Sr. was an angel investor for Steve Jobs when he left Apple. And Ross Bro Sr. was likely a mentor to uh, somebody like a Steve Jobs. Now, when you look at the history here, both of these great leaders have an incredible legacy to be proud of. In fact, you're going to hear a lot about Ross Bro Jr. today, about their businesses, success, and the incredible values of this great family. It's really impressive. And again, something to be so proud of. But a little bit about Ross Bro Jr. before we dive in. He is the founder of the real estate development company known as Hillwood. It was founded in 1988. Their diversified portfolio today, it's estimated to exceed about 70 million square feet with acquisitions of over 250 million square feet of industrial space and over 100 residential communities. Ross and the Hillwood team are also responsible for developing the country's first industrial airport, Fort Worth Alliance Airport. It was through a unique public and private partnership, actually. The airport now anchors Alliance, Texas. That's another 27,000 acre mixed use master plan, mixed use community, and that's just outside of Fort Worth. And to give you some scale of this, Alliance, Texas has generated more than 100 billion into regional economic impact. And the area is home to over 61,000 employees and 525 companies, it's huge. Um, another big accomplishment, Hillwood also developed Briscoe Station. That's a 1.8 billion, 242 acre mixed use development in of course, Frisco, Texas, as I mentioned. And that just opened in 2021. He is also the co-founder and CEO of Pro Systems Corporation, which was later uh, acquired by Dell uh, in 2009. There's so much to talk about here and so much to unpack. You're going to love this interview. Um, he was all, he has a great story. He was also the first to fly around the world in a helicopter in less than 30 days in 1982. Imagine going to your parents and saying, you know, I think I'm going to fly around the world. What do you think? Um, I, I might cringe if it was my son, but he did it. His father supported him and so did his mom. It's it's great. There's so much here. The entire interview is fantastic. So please join us for the entire uh, interview. As I mentioned, uh, super interesting. And there's so much to share about he and his father, the family, the adventures, you name it. So I'm going to stop talking now. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to dive into the interview. So please join me in welcoming Ross Pro Jr. Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us today for Zonda's inspirational 
series. We're going to talk a lot about leadership today, and we are here with uh, one of the greatest leaders I think we have in the country, uh, Ross Rowe Jr. with Hillwood Development. So, Ross, welcome. Uh, thank you. Thank you for I'm joining to be us. Here. I'm so excited to do this interview. You know, I I usually start out with the simplest question of all, which is, what do you do? But I want to start first with, tell us a little bit about Hillwood and what Hillwood does, and then I want to know, how would you describe your role with Hillwood? Okay, Hill Hillwood is a real estate development company, mostly. But the Hillwood brand kind of floats around away from real estate. But today we'll talk about real estate. Mm -hmm. And so within Hillwood, I have it broken into two big categories. You've got and two leaders. Todd Platt runs half. Mike Berry runs the other. Mike Berry runs the Alliance program, which is our large, largest program, 27,000 acres. And he runs the urban program, all of our downtown Dallas activity. Todd Platt runs the industrial activity, our investment activity, and our residential program. Fred Ball reports into Todd. Okay, so I've kind it. of, I've, in my mind, split in two, but as far as direct reports, you know, basically Fred Ball is a direct report to me. So if you had the residential team with Fred, the global industrial team with Todd, the alliance team with Mike Berry. And, and but there just... are lots of companies, like we have land and cattle company, we have a water company, we have an air, we manage the alliance airport, we do the fueling at alliance, so... Underneath those big real estate brands, there are lots of businesses underneath them that most people don't understand what we do. How did it all start? Uh, it started. Uh, so I was, uh, let's go back to my, how I grew up. Sure. And so I'm the oldest of five children and I have four sisters. And so I grew up in a household with four sisters, a mother, a grandmother, and an aunt. Where were you in that lineup? I'm number one. I'm the oldest. Never, okay, great. So I'm the oldest. So. So literally, my father and I were together all the time. Nice. And my father and I had a very close relationship. And he started out as a, a salesman for IBM. He became the top salesman in the country. He started EDS. And so I watched my father build EDS in our living room as a little boy. Really? And I, I knew all the leaders, and I watched them, and Dad would always tell me what he's doing. And then I'm eight or nine years old, and I kind of lived the American dream with my parents. I remember the day my father came in and says, look, EDS is about to go public. And tomorrow they're going to talk about how successful it was. And he looked at us. He said, look, it doesn't matter. It, you know, money is not important. It's our family and loving each other and helping other people. That's what's important. And so, you know, all my life, you know, dad became successful. And as I tell his grandchildren, you know, in the 60s, he's like the Bill Gates. He was the big technology guy and everybody wrote about him. But that was all fine. But we had a caring, loving family, and we always knew that we were the most important thing to our father. I mean, not business. That's His children great. and my mother. And so that was the environment we grew up in. So now my dad's in the technology business. And everybody look at me and say, what'd your dad do? I go, well, technology services. Well, no one knew what that was. And so I'd, you know, I'd go out on the weekend. On Saturdays, I would go to the EDS data center with my father to go to work and I collected punch cards and, you know, I just kind of hung out with him. But then in the seventies, he jumped into real estate. Okay. So that's why we have real estate today is my father was started to buy and sell land in North Dallas. And how did he transition really from technology to real estate? Well, what made that passive job? investor. Okay. He, he started to buy land and we had our original partner was a man named Dale Hill and all the, Older real estate bets in town with no Dale Hill. And Dale would, would buy the land. My father would invest with Dale. And we'd buy and sell land. And so on the, on the weekends, we'd go look at the land. And so I'd drive land with my father. And then we bought all the, all the land that's legacy today. We bought in the 70s. Wow. How, how much did you guys buy then? How many acres is 2, it? 2,500 acres. Wow. That's and that's where we used to ride horses on legacy. And then fast forward a little bit, 1981, that's where I learned how to fly a helicopter. I flew helicopters all through that land at Legacy. I hear there's a helicopter story. Uh, there are lots of helicopter stories. <laughs> I so, want to hear I mean, about so, the so, helicopter story. So, we'll get to we'll, that. We'll get to that. I mean, yeah. so, so I grew up in an environment where I was in real estate early with my father. We started to buy and sell land. I would then, then he kept telling, if you, so I'll go back a little bit farther. I remember when we bought the, the original EDS campus on Forest Lane. Now, this is for the 
these are for your old viewers and listeners. I love but it. But in the early 70s, we bought a bankrupt golf course. And my father moved from Exchange Park, where where that's where he had the EDS headquarters, and they had the big EDS letters on the building. And but we had grew it. Bought the bankrupt golf course. And I remember every weekend we're going out to the golf course and I'm watching the EDS buildings being built. And we had a three-story data center and a seven-story administrative building, which are still there today. If you go to Forest Lane and Central, it's still there. And we're building that seven-story building. And I'm I'm, I'm here walking these floors with him. I said, Dad, are we ever going to fill this up? He goes, God, Ross, I hope so. He goes, I, I don't know, but I hope so. Well, the building was full before it opened. So then my father goes to Dallas City Council. He said, I need to build more buildings. I need more zoning at Legacy or, or at Forest Lane campus. And the city council turned him down. And so that's why my dad went to Plano, bought the land. And so in the middle of all that, we, we, we he had land already. He bought more land. Then he went to EDS and said, look, we're leaving Dallas. We're headed to Plano. And so if you look at legacy today, the roots of that go back to a failed zoning case. <laughs> well, Stories, I, this way, very few people know this history. Well, it's really interesting. But this is why we went to Plano and then Tom Luce. Mm-hmm. Tom Luce was our attorney. Tom Luce is doing the zoning. And so Tom finally came back and said, okay, Mr. Pro, every time I get zoning, you tell me you want more. You know, how much, I mean, what do you want? And then finally, Tom came and said, okay, I've got it. Here's what dad said. Dad said, Tom, so how much, what do you want? And dad said, I want more zoning than downtown Dallas. And Lou said, okay. He goes to Plano. He gets zoning to be downtown Dallas. So legacy today is like 100,000 feet behind downtown Dallas. And dad told me, as we're out there riding horses, he said, this will be the new downtown for Plano and for North Dallas. and." It is. Wow. So that was his vision. So I guess my point, we bought and sold land. I watched him build the Forest Lane campus. I watched him build the Legacy campus. And so I'm now right out of college. And so I start buying and selling land with Dale. How old are you at this time? I'm 21, 22. Okay. So I jump in and start buying Wow. Around. So like right away. Well, because I what I'd been around. So I start well, buying land. You've been doing it forever with your father. With my father. Right. And so so most people, so the family business was technology, but technology's hard for a father, son to work on together. We did it. Mm-hmm. But real estate is a great business to work on with your family because you can understand it. So that's where I learned to love real estate. That's why even this morning, I'm, I was flying real estate, and I, I was I was at a big checking event. out a new acquisition. Well, no, I, I, I was at Alliance for a big event, and I had like okay. thirty minutes free on my schedule. And the morning news was talking about all the high growth cities north of town. Right, we've got a big project called Union Park. Mm-hmm. And Union Park is like third or fourth in town. Really, really beautiful project our team's doing. But then I read that Dr. Horton's got one bigger on top of us, and I said, "Look, I gotta go look at it." So I'm up there flying around the suburbs of North Dallas, just to see what's going on. But that's what I love to do. But I did it with my father, and I still do it today. Does that help? That, no, that's Very perfect. long answer to your question. No, that's perfect. So let me ask you this today. Like, on a day-to-day standpoint, if you were to describe your job, How what, what do you do on a day-to-day basis? I get to work with great people. <laughs> now, I really, I'm so grateful for the men and women I work with every day. They're very talented. They're very ambitious. And literally, I get to spend my day with the great team we have. But then we have great partners. We have great visitors. And I go home at night and tell my wife, it's like it's like I've been in school all day. Because you learn all day long from this incredible people that are on the team or come to visit. So it, it is a really rich, exciting day. And then I get to, to focus on you know, a lot of time with clients. So I was with clients this morning, I'm with you this afternoon, I'll be with all of our new associates after this. So I, I'll, you know, I'm with the team or with the clients, is how I like to spend my day. You know, it's interesting, I've spent a lot of time with your people and they're, they're, they are great. 
um, and great leadership. Um, excited to be here. Some of the most passionate people I've worked with. How do you actually select your leadership? I mean, what do you look for? I mean, how how have you well, formed such well, a great we, team? We were, we were so fortunate because, you know, the leaders in Hillwood today have been here average 25, 30 years. And so really when I got started, I was able to find amazing men and women to come on board and they stayed and they've, they've, then they've dedicated their career working with us at Hillwood. And so I try to create an environment where number one, great people want to be here, but then I want to create an environment where they want to stay because all of them could have left to form their own company. So let's talk about that. What do you think the key ingredients are to really building a place where people want to stay? Because you're right. You can hire great people, mm -hmm. but retaining good people is a totally different thing. Number one, we, we each of them, they really get to run their own business. So you're giving them the autonomy they need. They have yep. huge autonomy. And, you know, my big joke is you can do whatever you want, you know, legal integrity, et cetera, but you can do whatever you want. But if you need money, you have to come see me. And yeah. so that's how I kind of watch everything. They run it day to day. They've got a new deal. They've got to come see me. We figure out how we're going to pay for it. And that's how I kind of keep up. And then most of the partners want me to be with clients and see clients. So I stay involved in the business. And every Monday I review every project all over the world with every partner. And I stay up to speed with the real estate team. And who is your client? Well, we've got clients, I mean, every kind of client. Right. So we have like Alliance today, you have 530 different firms at Alliance. My client this morning was Gulfstream. We just opened the big Gulfstream maintenance base at Alliance. Mm -hmm. And we've worked on it 20 years. I mean, we really are, when, when you say long-term, we really are long-term because Mark Burns and I met 20 years ago. And they had a little facility Alliance. And they closed it during the recession. And I said, look, that's great, but we're still going to be here. I look forward to when you're ready to grow again, we're going to be here. They started to grow. They came out. We built the building for them. So we're very long-term, very focused on quality, and taking great care of our clients. And that's why we also rarely do we lose a client. I mean, once we start to work like Amazon, you know, we do nine to ten Amazon buildings all the time. We've been doing it now for 10 years mm -hmm. and we do the most complex buildings Amazon has. We have built for them there. We've built two of their big air trade hubs, uh, which very few developers have done. And so we really have got a veteran team, experienced team. So when Amazon slows down, we say, great. We want us to do. We're not building as much now as we used to, but our goal is as soon as they start again, we're here and we're ready. And in COVID, you know, when most people were shut down, we call Amazon and say, look, we're here. You're still building. We're still building for you. You know, whenever you want us in Seattle, we'll be there. And so when Amazon, the first outside visitors Amazon had was Hillwood because we would always be there to take care of the client. And the work from home wasn't part of our program. So that's a really big part of it is it's just knowing, saying, and really acting on being there for the people well, you commit to and they commit back. Well, well and, and if you're on this team, you know, you will, you're going to take care, number one, you got to take care of your team, right. take care of your teammates, but you must take care of the client. And it's like, if you need a building, we're going to get it done. And if you have a really hard building that no one else can do, you call us because we will get it done one way or another. And we do very complex zoning cases and we have developed some extraordinary complicated sites with deep brownfield environmental problems and many of our peers avoid that but we've done so many now that we almost look for it because we can work with the epa we, we, we can work with every government agency you know faa on airports epa on environmental dot on roads We've done it so much around the country, and we have, and we've been in so many cities around the country developing Molly, that when we go to a new city, you know, I'll tell the mayor, I say, Mayor, here are fifty mayors you can call. You can call mayors all across the country, ask them if we delivered and did what we said we would do, and we do, over and over and over again, 
And that's a critical part of our culture. And that's why clients stay with us as we deliver. I think largely on a lot of the stuff that I've worked on with your team, mm. you don't just deliver, you over deliver. I mean, it's, it's we do. above expectation. If you look at our, let's go back to our communities. Sure. And home building. Sure. I mean, look, look at Harvest. <laughs> I mean, good, look, that, that, that mile and a half long linear park. But I, I told my wife, you know, Fred Balder won the, the, this big award this week. And, and, and I was looking at the photos. I, I told my wife, Sarah, I said, Sarah, I don't know if there's a community in this part of the country that has a park system and an amenity base like we have for the $350,000 home. Mm-hmm. And these are incredible neighborhoods. And I was flying again this morning. I'm flying Pecan Square and Harvest. And I'm looking down at Pecan Square at our double pools. I oh, said, it's unbelievable. These double pools. I said, this, this is phenomenal. And you look at the children and the quality of the schools and the neighborhoods we're building. And, and people talking about, you know, home building. I said, we're not, you know, we really are neighborhood developers. I mean, we're developing a rich, full neighborhood. And when politicians say we need more affordable housing, I said, well, that's right. But I'd also add you want an affordable neighborhood. Not just the house. You need the sidewalk. You need the pools. You need the schools. You need a master plan developer to help you build that neighborhood. And that's what we do at Hillwood. Well, the reality is you're building the community and the lifestyle for families just like the one that you spoke of with your father and your mom that's and right. kids. And and so for them to make it all about their family, too. Um, when I drive our communities on the weekend and I look at all those children and moms and dads running around, yeah. I really, and I tell our team. Is that this. the best part? Oh, it's it's unbelievable! It's so part. unbelievable. I that's why that's why real estate's it's my so great. favorite part. That's why real estate's that's such an unbelievable business to be in because you have such a great impact on your community. And you know, where would cities be if you didn't have great developers? Do you ever I mean, have, you know, think about it? I mean, great cities had great developers, and it and it's hand in hand relationship. Where would we be with, if we didn't have Trammell Grow? What would Dallas be? Well, think about the legacy that not just your father, you, Fred, that whole team. I mean, I think about this fairly regularly. I mean, this is going to be here forever beyond our life, right? I mean, it's such a legacy to leave behind. I mean, it's it's a little overwhelming when you really think about the responsibility and what you're doing. So now, on that point, so I keep trying to tell people, like, what do we do? You know, we're building a university park in Highland Park Mm -hmm. about every seven or eight years. And so if you know the park cities, we've duplicated that two or three times. And that's what I told my children. And they go, oh, wow, okay, we got it. I mean, these are big neighborhoods, and and they will be there in perpetuity. And so it really is, I feel like you're really giving back, and you're really helping your community. Unbelievable. And you're helping families. And I think you're helping keep families together and keep families happy. And so it, it is a, a, a really wonderful business to be in. And then combine that with the level of lifestyle that you're giving them in a market like we're in today at an affordable price. I mean, it's unbelievable. I mean, it's, it really is fantastic. 20% of Harvest is California. <laughs> Those are my people. <laughs> no, 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 people are coming from California. And yeah. we're actually selling homes sight unseen on the Internet from California. And we have really? police families. We had a police family move in. I said, why are you here? And they go, Mr. Pro, I can't be a policeman in California. It, it, my family's at risk. I can be a policeman here, but not in California. So you're getting, you're getting, and we're getting lots of retired military. We've got a three-star Marine general moved into Pecan Square. I mean, I, That's I, I said, General, I said, why are you here? That's pretty neat. He said, because it's great community. And then a, a, a family moved in from LA. I said, why do you, why do you like North Texas? They go, we can't believe Fourth of July. All the flags. They go, our street is lined with American flags. They love this Texas culture. Well, and I it's it's really funny too because I, I can't underscore the importance of the social infrastructure mm-hmm. you guys also have in play for Harvest and for mm-hmm. Con Square and all of your master plans. And it's just bringing that community together well, to dude, celebrate, right? Planners. Oh, my God. They're fantastic. And, 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 I mean, they have events all the time. You have some of the best, I think, in the country. I mean, I, mm-hmm. I've said that before. <laughs> Brian cautions me on that. But but you have some of the best in the country. I mean, well, they're fantastic. It, it's a great team. And they're it great is events. a good team. And these are for $350,000 in the Argyle school system. I mean. 
Oh, and the, what what a value! Beautiful schools. I mean, it really. Two brand new ones at Harvest. Two brand outrageous. new ones. Yeah, they're, those they're, are great. They're, but you you drive those schools, and it is incredible what you're able to do. So I want to get back to you. Mm-hmm. And so I want to I want you to sort of rewind back to, and I always pick the age eight, but at eight years of age, I, I, again, you're traveling around with your father. I love the story that you guys were super close. Uh, well, he was, he was a, at eight, eight, he was a salesman for IBM. Yes. And so we had one car. Okay. We lived on Linden Lane. I watched LBJ being built with my dad. Oh, wow. And mom and I used to drive dad literally right across the street to work at the IBM headquarters, which has now been torn down. And so one reason we picked this site for our headquarters is it was almost a 50-year journey for Ross Perot. He started across the street at IBM, Forest Lane, Legacy, North Dallas. He came all the way home at the end of his journey to where he started with this site. Oh, that's pretty neat. That's really cool. So 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 at eight, eight, he's a salesman. We had one car. Mom and I dropped him off at work. And I just was, you know, just a happy little kid. Was there any sort of aspirations? If you weren't in real estate, did you have any other aspirations of, I think I want to be this one day? Or was well, it well, always I sort mean, of? Well, we have a great real estate practice. Mm-hmm. We've got a great oil and gas business. We've also been oil and gas since the 70s. And so I'm very active in the oil and gas business. Hillwood Energy. That's why the Hillwood brand is on things besides just real estate. We have a very active venture capital business. We've got a strong investment team. We invest all over the world. Uh, and then technology. I, I ran, so we, we sold EDS in 84. Mm-hmm. We started, uh, Dad sold it twice. First piece in 84 to General Motors. Then he became the largest shareholder to GM for two years. Created so much havoc with the GM board that they bought him out a second time. Because he kept saying, why are you doing this? And he went to the General Motors board. He said, okay, I'm getting tired. Every time I talk to dealers, they tell me our cars aren't any good. He said, so where are we number one? Are we number one in anything? And they couldn't produce anything in number one. He goes, look, the goal this year should be number one in something. If it has to be just a cigarette lighter, let's make <laughs> it the greatest cigarette lighter ever. But this car, this company's got to become number one in something. And that type of agitation, they didn't want. So they bought them out. Then we started Pro Systems in 88. They didn't like it, so they bought Although, them out. No, because he voted against the board. He voted against management. Interesting. And then he would go break off. It's like completely No, no I mean, Dad, Dad the, the union guys in Arlington at the truck factory, they call him up and say, come on, have, have lunch with us. Dad goes, God, I'd love to come have lunch with you guys. So he's down there hanging out with the union guys, walking the floor, talking to all the men and women that make the truck. And that's not what GM management wanted. They didn't want a board member knowing what really goes on on the front lines. Well, my dad lives on the front lines. Right. He didn't like headquarters. He wanted front <laughs> lines. I mean, that's where great leaders live is Some out my, there with the troops. I agree. Some of my favorite leaders are like in the trenches, and I totally agree with you. Well, you have to be. And so he brought that back up, and they go, Mr. Bro, a board member has never eaten lunch with union members. In our world, it's like, well, what are you talking about? I mean, right. this, this, we're all the same team. Right. These are the men and women that make the car. They're, they're the most important people. This is how we're successful. General Motors yes. are, are the men and women that make the car. <laughs> he, no, Daddy, he said, not you guys hanging out on the seventh floor in Detroit. <laughs> you know, something like that. <laughs> Lawyers and accountants. He goes, you, you, guys got, you, got, you guys aren't making the car. <laughs> These guys make the car. Exactly. But that's the environment that I grew up in. That's pretty neat. And that's so I was pretty. in technology. We started Pro Systems. I became CEO of that company. I ran that for four years and I became the chairman. And so I've been in the technology. I've been in lots of different businesses and I love them all. But today we're here to talk about real estate. Right. But so I still that's what I focused on. But today we're really here to talk about Ross Pro, okay. you. And so I really want to know kind of what your favorite things are too. And and on that note, let's let's jump into a couple of personal things if you don't mind. Sure. Um, favorite pastime. What do you love to do? If you're not working, what are you doing? Well, I'm I'm flying. So I fly all the time. I ride horses. Uh, yeah, that's kind of, I love to hunt, ride horses, fly. And that kind of, between work and family, it fills up your week. Favorite but every, every Saturday, I'll be, out, I'll be out riding horses. Oh, really? Yeah. Nice. Mm-hmm. And uh, but I grew up riding with my father. Right. And so my dad and I rode every Saturday. And so again, something I grew up doing with him. And now that he's passed... 
it, it's it's really emotional. I go out Saturday, I go ride, and I kind of you you think of him. That's kind of mm-hmm. that's your way to connect with him. Mm-hmm. I love that. Yeah, I love that. I was close to my dad too. Uh, what is your uh, what is your favorite place to visit? Well, Vacation, like my favorite city. Whatever. I mean, probably yeah. London. London. My wife okay. and I we have a home outside of London, and so we're there a lot. And that's our European headquarters. So oh, I'm there nice. a lot for business in London. What do you love about it? Well, I love the people, and we have a mill house around the country. We've been there long enough. Do you have now. horses there? No, no horses. I wish we did. <laughs> but we've been out there long enough now. We know all of our neighbors, and it, you know. So and and I love the city, and I love our friends in the city, and I love the business environment. It really, we've had lots of businesses in the UK. We're now building warehouses around the UK, and it it it's just something that I really enjoy doing. Who were your um, in your formative years? Who were your your heroes growing up? Well, certainly my father. Right. But then I grew up. So reporter asked me, "Dad's run for president in the '92," and the reporter comes in. She goes, "It must be tough being Ross Perot's son." I said, "Well, no, not really." <laughs> Ross, Ross Perot's son is a pretty good gig. It's a pretty good gig. I mean, it is a pretty good deal because <laughs> my dad took me everywhere with him. And and so 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 literally, you know, I saw things and I did things that very few people can do, and that's one of the great blessings that I've had. And so, what was the original question? I so so heroes, is sort of. So, here, so I've had, I've had without these, a doubt. No, so, so here I am, freaking amazing. So here I am, you know, I love space, and I had these little model rockets, and I'd shoot model rockets up in the front yard, and my dad saw that, and this is like Apollo six and Apollo seven. Well, he goes, let's go watch the moon launch. So we go down to Cape Canaveral, and I watch Apollo 11 go up with my father. Well, then I became friends. So heroes, I became friends. Dad became great friends with Frank Borman. So Frank Borman Borman (laughs) would would fly his T-38 into Love Field in his flight suit and have dinner at our home. Well, you know, no wonder I wanted to be a pilot. Well, no wonder and, and, and your dad so, so, was so, such a hero. <laughs> and so I had, I had all these astronauts that I knew. Oh, my god! And then gosh. my father helped the prisoners of war in Vietnam. So I then you had all that. these great military heroes, Robbie Reisner, one of the great fighter pilots in our nation. And Robbie became a great family friend. And Robbie, when I, when I became a pilot in the Air Force, Robbie was there to pin on my wings. And so I had Robbie wow. Reisner. I had Frank Borman. Then I had, you know, business leaders would come by. Mr. Rockefeller would come by to see my father. I'd, and my father always oh had me God. with him. So David Rockefeller, I'm talking to David. I really am more listening. But then as I got older, you know, now I'm hanging out with Steve Jobs. And Dad and Steve were big buddies. And so I'm having lunch with Steve. And Steve started Apple, got fired, and then he started Next. Right. And we were one of Steve's main investors in Next Computer. And my father was on the board with Steve. And so I'm hanging out with Steve Jobs. And so, you know, incredible. Incredible and the, people. And, the, and then, you know, Margaret Thatcher comes and spends what? a week with us in Bermuda. And so I'm with Margaret and Sir Dennis. And so, I mean, literally, if you're kind of in the in the the, the flow of Ross Perot. That's pretty you great. You meet a lot of amazing people. Great hero, Ronald Reagan. Oh, you know, so, so, my gosh. So 1977. May of 77, I graduated from St. Mark's School. You know, guess who our graduation speaker was? Ronald Reagan. Oh, my goodness. Governor Reagan. Wow. Because we watched him at St. Mark's in 1976. He had the big floor fight with Ford to become the nominee for the Republican Party, and he lost. But we all really like Reagan. Such a good speaker, too. He's unbelievable. Oh, He's, and so, and then, then all, my, all my buddies look at me, and they go, we're in the senior lounge. They go. We need to get Reagan. And of course, they all look at me and they go, call me H. H. Ross <laughs> Hey, H. Call your old man. You know, we need to get, to get this Reagan. done. <laughs> well, because of the Vietnam War and what we did for the POWs, my father Which had is a remarkable. Big, he had a huge parade in San Francisco for the POWs and the Sante Raiders. And the Sante Raiders, that was the team that went in to rescue the POWs in Vietnam. It failed because the camp was empty. And my father said, look, let's get the POWs and the Sante Raiders linked up so the POWs can thank them for the Sante Raiders trying to save their lives. So big excuse to have a party in San Francisco. Governor Reagan of California, Nancy Reagan were there. John Wayne was there. I mean, another classic Ross Perot event. Wow. And so 
I've been surrounded oh. by incredible men and women. Uh, just to be, and then so 1982, I fly a helicopter around the world. 40th anniversary. I, uh, Friday was the 40th anniversary of the trip. Well, you know. So what year was this? 1982. I'm flying okay. a helicopter around the world. Okay. Well, then night. You know, what we, inspired we, you to fly a helicopter? We're on a. That's all. <laughs> I'll come back. Okay. But then, but then, you know, Reagan was president. Mm -hmm. The White House agreed to help us on the trip. I go around the world. I go see President Reagan. I'd give him stories about the trip. We had a great visit with President Reagan. So, so Reagan had, from high school graduation to the around the world trip, I mean, it had a huge impact on my life. Wow. So that's part of leaders and people so, in my life. So that was a loaded question. Like inspirational leaders, that was quite a lineup. Oh, some, some of the best. Cool. Some incredible The leaders. best. But, but they still come in the building. I mean, every week we, we, we get great, great American leaders of business and politics come in. Well, whether you realize this or not, people talk about you in a very similar vein. And they're, they just, I mean, everything I've heard about you is just exactly that. Well, so it's, it's very, ama very, very again, kind. amazing to be kind. here. That's crazy. So, so with all of that, I mean, that's quite a lineup. I, I don't even, it's almost overwhelming. Mm -hmm. It's such a big lineup. So it's back to what that reporter said. But, it, it, it's not a bad deal to be a Ross Pro Not a bad yeah. deal. Not a bad deal. And definitely uh, one of the most inspirational men out there, too. I mean, revered by so many, for sure. And, and, um, he, and, and, and as I tell a lot of young business leaders, you know, and he never leaned on me to go to business with him. Well, how could All you not life, want he said, to, Look, He said, I just want you to be a, have a positive impact on society. He said, if you want to be a policeman, that's great. If you want to be a military, full-time you know, military officer, that's great just to have a positive impact. And so he never forced me to want to work with him. But the more he said, go do something else, the more I wanted to be with him. Right. And, and I love working with him. And, and I never, but since you don't have pressure to be here, I think it makes it easier to want. And then he let me do things he never should have let me do. Like so like, what? Well, like flying like around what? the world. Flying around the world in a helicopter. Okay, so like. I mean, you're, eight, you're, you're, you're 23 years old. And he let me do it. And I've in a way, it was a phenomenal adventure. How but did your mom like deal with that? I'd my mom, like, oh. my, well, my mom, my mom is, is I you want to do she, what? My mom, if you look at the success of Ross Perot, it's because he had Margot Perot as his foundation. I, you know, what, she is so a many great lady. People have a great partner. And yes, it was a fabulous marriage, a great partnership. And my father was always doing something crazy. And my mother was calm. She was a banker's daughter from Greensburg, Pennsylvania. And she was calm, went to, and she just steady and went to Goucher College and very traditional. And she married this very untraditional Texan. And so as my father would go off and do his projects, she was stable. She took care of us. She loved him. She supported him. But she, my mother was very calm. So I went around the world. She wasn't too worried. She, as a matter of fact, the dinner on Friday night, I said, Mom, were you worried about it all? She said, you know, if your father thought it was okay, I knew you were going to be safe. And so she was calm, but my father was the one who was so worried. You know, he yes. worried every day. You know, where are right. you? What are you doing? You know, he actually, there got the point. He goes, look, you can fly around the world, but everybody tells me, it's, it's dangerous to fly at night. Don't fly at night. When you, you can't get around the world and not fly at night. Now, how long did that trip take? <clears throat> and took what? 29 days. 20, 29 days mm -hmm. in a helicopter. Mm -hmm. And so, craziest part of that trip? The beginning. And so, August 1st of 82, a man named Dick Smith, Australian, mm -hmm. took off to be the first man to fly around the world in a helicopter. It had never been done. And I read about it in the Dallas paper. He took off from Bell Helicopter. I read about it. And this is in the old days where you get a slip of paper on your desk. And I I got back to work, slip of paper, call your dad. I called dad. So yes, sir. He said, you see the paper? I said, yes, sir. He goes, did you read about the Australian? I said, sure. He goes, well, what do you think? I said, dad, we ought to go beat him. And dad goes, that's a great idea. Let's go beat him. Because my dad loved big, bold, unconventional ideas. I mean, he, he wanted action. He didn't like a single or a double. He wanted home runs, big impact. 
He loved be it. number one in something. And so and so we I started you know I started calling people, start working on the trip, getting everybody put together to go beat Dick Smith. And about four days into it, he called me up and said, "What are you doing?" I said, "I'm working on that round the world helicopter trip." He said, "You know, we got a lot going on. You know, you're my only son. I don't think we need to do this." Let's so pull I, back so on now, that because we were in different buildings. I, I went out, went to his building, went to see him, and I said, "And he, you know, he's trying to talk me out of it." I said, "Dad." This is how you raised me. I mean, you raised me to, to do this. I mean, I saw you in Vietnam helping POWs. I saw you rescue your, your men out of Iran in 1979. And I kind of shamed him into it, which is the only time I ever did that. But he looked at me, he goes, <laughs> but okay. But it worked But it, but it worked. He goes, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> he said, but I'm in charge of safety, <laughs> which I thought was like the world's greatest compromise. And then I got out because as soon as I... Got the order. I left. I didn't want him to change his mind. Right. And so we were off in 30. So the craziest part, beginning, the idea to starting was 30 days. And you're done 30 days later. That's a very high impact 60 days. And a third of what we did was flying. And two thirds was the ground team that supported us all over the world. Because it was all hands on deck to get permission to get into all these countries. So you had to literally, as you're, you plotted out your course mm -hmm. and as you're landing, there's someone there to just. Well, you had to get, you had, you had to get the fuel done. You had to get right. maintenance done. Right. Someone had to get hotel rooms because you're, you really couldn't spend time finding hotels, finding transportation. You had to have advancement all over the world. And if we made the stop we're supposed to make, it all worked. But two or three times we didn't make the stop, then we're on our own. Were there a couple of sort of mishaps on that? Trip? Oh, every day. Every day was a lifetime <laughs> adventure. I mean, literally, we did stuff every day that if you're going to be a long time, long term pilot, you shouldn't do what we did going around the world. <laughs> we flew under bridges. We flew under power lines. I mean, we did crazy stuff. But we were kind of on a mission from God, and we felt like the rules didn't apply <laughs> to us. And I was 23, so 23. At 23, your judgment's not the best. And then Jay Coburn, my co-pilot, he was a, a highly decorated combat pilot out of Vietnam. So Jay also liked adventure. And so we did a lot of stuff you shouldn't do. And we had an incredible adventure. So now you have kids today. I do. I have four. Four. Boy, girl. Two boys, two girls. Yeah. So now your oldest comes to you and says, Dad, I want to fly around the world in a helicopter. Well, I'd have to say yes. <laughs> you'd I mean, say I mean, yes. I'd, I'd have you'd to, say oh, yes if you didn't support it. Absolutely, yes. mm -hmm. that's exciting. Okay, he, well, there my, it is. My, well, my if you're son, listening, well, my, my oldest son flew S 16s in the Air Force. So oh wow! Okay, he, he great. Had, he had good adventure. So the so the museum you have here at Hillwood, boy, is that impressive. I mean, it's so neat to go through. In fact, I think by the end of the night, as I and I've walked it several times, being here at the Hillwood offices, mm -hmm. but. I think the number one thing I heard people sort of in the halls, all of us, and, and with some extremely accomplished people is, wow, I don't feel very accomplished. <laughs> Once you go well, through all of the stuff, your family, your father, well, I mean, I've, all, it's I've incredible. very accomplished people through and they go, how, wow. did you, how, how does your father do this in one life? How did he do it? Well, because he, he number one, he had a great team. He recruited and a great family people. Well, he, he, but that, that's what, it's the other thing I tell young, young families is, you know, my father did all this, but he'd come home at night. We were number one. And at our dinner table, it, he never talked about what he did. He wanted to know what we did. And that's we never great. found out what my father did. If it wasn't in the newspaper, you know, I was in the newspaper a lot, but we'd have to read the paper to find out what my dad did, you know, what my father was up to. He wanted to focus on us. And then my father would tell me, he goes, look, I can't go out and help people and do the things I do if you kids misbehave. He said, if you behave, you do your job, then I, it allows me to go out and get these things done. So we felt like we were on his team. And it's very important for your children to feel like they're on the team and they sure. know what their father does. They know what their mother does. And my father was gone a lot, but we knew what he was doing. And it's like, he was really helping people. He's helping the POWs in Vietnam. I mean, he's going to rescue his men out of Iran. And so we knew what he was doing. It was a noble cause. And so we supported it. Was that ever scary for you as his son? 
Being a well, part of that? The, the, the day he went into Iran to rescue the, the, his, his uh, associates, he called me up on the phone. I'm in college. He said, look, he said, you know what I'm doing? He wouldn't, we wouldn't talk clearly on the phone. He goes, you know what I'm going to do? He goes, if I don't come home, you got to drop out of school and you take care of your mother and your sisters. I mean, all my life I heard you take care of your mother and your sisters. And so you've you've always had that responsibility in our family. Family first. Family first. And that's what he told me to do. And I'd have done it. But luckily he came. Sure. And then hanging up that phone where you just like, oh, how long, no, how long no, did I it think, take you I until think, you knew? You know, it, 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 I didn't worry much about it. Really? I mean, he, you know, my father's an amazing man. He's on a, he was on an unbelievable journey. And if the Lord decided that journey was going to end at that moment, it'd been painful, but so be it. His his path to run because he for didn't worry much. I mean, he didn't he didn't spend a whole lot of time worrying about something. No, he like was that. out. He was always out in front. You know, what's the next problem? You know, worrying doesn't solve problems. I mean, he was out executing. So fast forward, he decides to run for president. How, can you talk a little bit but about this, how this that is, formed? This is back to. Well, kind of what I've inferred, right? I mean, if you if you go in the museum and all your all your viewers are welcome sure. to get you know, call something, come to the museum, but you'll see the Larry King interview. So Larry King kept asking my father, "What will it take to run for president?" My father says, "Look, the American people don't want me to run for president." And Larry goes, "You know, he get pushed. He got pushed into it." And on Larry King, he said, "Okay, look, if the American people want me to run for president, you know, call me." He's, and then he thought that's what kind of got him off of it, but right. he, never, it. he never talked to my mother about it. My mom was in Washington with him, not in the studio. She's watching her hotel room, and she said, she saw it on television. Dad comes in. She goes, what's all that about? And Dad said, well, you know, no one, he said, Margo, no one wants to be president. My mom knew that something happened that night. Because the next morning, they had letters and contributions were slid under their door from the staff of the hotel asking him to run for president. That gives me the chills. I mean, in that, it just, it just you know, real America said, we want you to run for president. And that's the nerve he touched. But he never asked my mom. Certainly didn't talk to the children. You know, my dad was a kind of a focus group of one. If he looked in the mirror and he kind of wanted to do it, he he was gone. And we were all there to support him and to love him, whatever he was going to do. So in in an economy, not an economy, in the world we live in today, and I'm going to go there, um, we need great leadership. Mm -hmm. I mean, great leadership. And we need great candidates. Would you ever run? That's not 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 in my my game plan. My not father, in the game my plan. father told me after the ninety two election, he said, "You never do this." Really? Yeah. Why is that? He said. He said. He said it, it is not productive. He said you can be so much more productive. You get so many more things done in the private sector and make a than, difference. Than, than, and really make a difference than, than trying to get into this world. Certain people are great at it. And they're and they're wonderful. And so I'm very involved politically. I help lots of candidates across the nation. Uh, lots of candidates come to see us, but it's not anything I'd get into on my own. And it's interesting. I, we 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 won't go down political mm -hmm. alleys here, but uh, we just need great men, great women, great leadership, and we'll keep going down that way. Um, okay, so a little word association. What's the first thing that comes to you when I say the word community? Hillwood. <laughs> I like that. Uh, you, you might okay, have okay. you might have the, the same answer for the next one, but okay. what no, I mean, come a community, families. I'm yeah. being serious. Okay. Like the serious that. answer yeah. is families. Sure. Okay. What about quality? Quality. The it You could say Hillwood the, again. No, no, well, it is good. Sorry, <laughs> I, I, that's a little not very creative the second time. Uh, quality is always getting better. I agree. And on Hillwood Good communities, answer. I say, yeah, we did harvest, which I thought was unbelievable. I said, okay, Fred, why is Pecan Square going to be better? How do you improve the quality of Pecan Square? So now we have Hunter Ranch coming. 
which is spectacular land. And it's like, okay, Fred, because I'm 63 now. So it used to be long-term project, 20, 30 years. I said, okay, great. Well, now it's the trip. You bring in like 40-year projects. I said, you know, I'm 100-something by the time you're done. So let's try to speed <laughs> it up. But, you know, could this, could this, this will be probably our last hurrah in the 35 West Quarter for a community. And you've got that beautiful land and those two knobs. I said, the quality has got to be outstanding. And so we're benchmarking, we're touring, we've got we've got all these different charrettes trying to come up with an unbelievably powerful community around those two hills that'll be second to none in this part of the country. And as we said earlier, we'll stay on the test of time. I've seen some of the brainstorming. It, it's it's, it's pretty, pretty incredible. Yeah, it is. It's really good. Last word for you, inspiration. My father. I mean, he, he is the the inspiration. I and his so courage, too. I mean, inspiration and courage, I think, go hand in hand. I agree. And a lot of people have ideas, lots of ideas out there, but you've got to have the courage to act. And courage is one of the traits there's not a lot of in the world today. Uh, and so courage is an important part of inspiration. I agree. So your father found a way to be so involved in so many different things. And from what I can see from what you're doing, you do too. Mm -hmm. Um, talk to me a little bit about, uh, building home for heroes. Well, that it goes all the way back to our roots. So if you think about the story I've been telling mm -hmm. in 1968, Ross Perot becomes known as a businessman with EDS going public. He was known as business, but very quickly Ross Perot jumped in to help in the prisoners of war, which is an international global effort that gave him publicity all over the world. So Ross Perot became known as a patriot and a philanthropist and a humanitarian. And that's where we started to help the military. Now, my father's in the Naval Academy, mm -hmm. good ties with the military, but we really got close to the military with the POWs, and we still continue that POW relationship today. We, still, we had the 45th anniversary of the POWs coming home at the ranch a couple of years ago. And so we still keep that deep tie. So now we help the prisoners of war. And then, then with the wounded veterans. And so when uh, President Bush went into Nicaragua, Nicaragua, Panama, went into Panama, mm -hmm. a couple of Navy SEALs were hurt. And so in that, Dad actually found the SEALs and brought them to the med school and said, look, I'm going to get the best medicine in the country and get these guys patched up. And he did. Then the first Gulf War, the special operation units start to call them. They go, we need things. And my father would buy things for the special operations teams, then get Fred Smith at FedEx to deliver them to the front line to the SEALs. And so then we're, so we're close to the Air Force, and I'm in the Air Force. It, and so this, and then, and then I didn't talk about it, it when, at EDS, as we built EDS and go back to leaders, we heavily recruited from the Vietnam War. So we were loaded with military oh, veterans at EDS. And so you had all these combat veterans at EDS, and they're the men, a lot of my heroes are the men I grew up with from the Vietnam War. So we've had deep, deep ties to the military. So when Homes for Heroes comes around, of course we're going to be there. Of course we're going to help, help these great veterans. And as I, as I mentioned on the 300th home we gave, I said, when you bring a veteran family into your community, you improve the whole community. I said, and that's what I told him. I, I said, you, you don't know the impact you're going to have on every child. They're going to see you. You served your country. You've got a serving heart. And now you're here. You're going to be helping every child here. And you're going to help every parent here. And if somebody thinks they're having a, a, a tough day, they might think of what you've gone through and realize, you know, my day's not that tough. Exactly. I'm, I'm not a quadriplegic. My day's not that tough. These are hard, tough great Americans. And when you bring these heroes into your community, it makes everybody better. And so for those that, that don't know the Home for Heroes program, it's if you could just explain. We donate what it the is. lot. Yes. And so that's our part. And then you get home builders will donate the home. And then interior designers will come donate all the interiors. And so everything is donated. And then on these home, this last home we just donated, it was really had to have special equipment. Uh, for the veteran because of his injuries. And so it all went in. It's free. 
And every year you're giving away a home or two. We try to, to these yeah, two or three homes. Um, it's fantastic. And then we do we do it in Austin, we do it in Houston, we do it in all of our communities. But when when you are with that family, because the family doesn't see the home until you have the celebration. And when you walk in and you see a family and they receive a new home, their lifetime home, the emotion is overwhelming. But wow. it's what we as a country should do. I agree. For these these families because they've made the ultimate they've sacrifice. Dedicated their lives for, for us. us. Right. Oh, for us, for sure. Well, as we, as we wrap up, I have, I have two questions. And the first one, uh, by the way, last night when Fred received his award as mm -hmm. legend, uh, I asked him his most inspirational uh, leaders. And of course, you were number one. And it was very touching and, and all the qualities that he really mm -hmm. admires and that you inspire in others. Uh, and you've had so many inspirational leaders. I mean, it's it's hard to count. So from, you know, Ronald Reagan, Steve Jobs, your father. I mean, all three of those remarkable. Um, tell me the if you were to sum up sort of the top qualities of those leaders, your takeaway as you practice and, you know, lead forward. What would you say those, those well, qualities uh, are? Uh, uh, courage. Is critical integrity then character and all three you, you've got to have all three if you're really going to be a great leader i agree just people have to believe in you mm -hmm. and and you learn that in the military i mean the most difficult leadership challenge is taking men and women into combat i mean that is extraordinarily difficult our military teaches that leadership skill every day mm -hmm. and and in the future as you're selecting leadership how do you actually select the best leaders that you, well, we, that you surround we, yourself with? Well, we, we try to have great, we love the military veteran model. So sure. the military veterans, but then our leaders, you, you watch them and you look at their backgrounds and you bring them in and you watch their career in the ones that you can have great characteristics, but you need to have ambition. So you can be well-trained, you can be smart, but if you don't have ambition, you won't make it very far here because we want people that really want to do something special, not just live. I mean, they, they, we want people to really thrive and really do something unique. And there are not many people that have all those combinations, but we at Hill would try to find them. That's pretty great. So I lied one last question. Mm -hmm. So what's ahead? The next uh, thirty years for Hillwood. Well, right, right what's now, ahead? right now, we're, <laughs> right now we're at that phase. You've got to really make sure you know what's happening, because we're going into a very unique phase of economic history. And my whole career, the Fed has always been trying to keep the economy going. It's the first time I've seen them stop the economy. And I've watched the '80s. I watched Volcker, but I wasn't really in the game. But now they're trying to stop the economy, and Rates have never gone up this high this fast. Never. And never in the history and of time. We we this experiment called quantitative easing, that's now become quantitative tightening, is very aggressive. And I've had senior ex Fed officials, two ex Fed officials have told me we're in uncharted territory. So this economy, no one quite knows where it's going to end up. So as a business leader, I've got to make sure our team is ready, mm -hmm. our projects are ready. you know. And so here we are. You think of all the money we have to borrow every year. We borrow billions to build these buildings around the country and overseas. So billions of dollars are needed to run this Hillwood machine. Well, the banks have now said the loans that are in process are fine, but we've been told by the regulators no new real estate lending. So if you want to see a real recession in the country, stop real estate lending. And that's what they've been told. And so you're going to see the next six months, it could be very, very difficult. And so our job is to make sure our team is ready. And, and we, we like to think we're conservative, but you want to really verify that you're conservative. Right. So I'm not going through every project, going through every building, going through every loan, and making sure everybody is ready for a slowdown. Because our history has been when you have a slowdown is when we gain the most ground. Right. 
And when things really are tough, we can really move the ball down the field. No, and we did it in the SNL crisis. I mean, Hillwood was almost built on the SNL crisis. I agree I mean, with we you. We were liquid going into it, you know, and we're liquid going into this crisis. You know, but I was going to auctions at the at, at, at the Kaminsky Hotel, mm-hmm. where the government was auctioning property every twenty seconds, and the government was taking you know five cents on the dollar of what they had loaned on these land, and we bought big pools of land from the government. Then the, it was so bad, the government then financed the transaction. And that was a big piece of what we did in the early 90s at Hillwood. Then we bought RTC land around Alliance. Mm-hmm. Then we started recapitalizing home builders in California. Then we went to Hawaii when they had their big Japanese implosion with real estate and started buying from Japanese companies. And then, I mean, every cycle. And then in 08, the big that, ha- the housing that, disaster of 08. You know, Fred Balda bought eight packages of lots from public home builders. These are our clients in trouble. They needed us to buy the land and get it off their out their balance sheet. Mm-hmm. We went and bought lots from our clients and took it off their balance sheet. That allowed them to survive and be in business. Well, you know, they're our best clients today. We bought it and then we sold it off. But you really get great long-term relationships. So the issue would be, In this correction, you want to be ready to really take advantage of the value that's going to come, and that's been our track record. So at this moment, I'm making sure we're ready for potential value. You know, and and interestingly enough, just as we record this, um, this may shift a little bit, but the the one thing that I really want to... uh, underscore too is it's the biggest opportunity for innovation and so when we look at like affordable housing solutions and we look at new solutions for realistically what's going on today i mean i think whenever you have a correction in the market it's when the best innovations are made 100 percent. my father would always say brains and wits you've right. got to live on brains and wits he said money makes you stupid I mean, and and good you, times you, to some degree well, make you money, stupid. Well, money the good, <laughs> look how stupid we've been. I mean, right. good Lord. I mean, you look at the past couple of years, you know, the meme stocks, the crypto stocks, the SPACs, you know, and you're in the middle of it and say, this doesn't feel right. Well, now you see the crash. I mean, it was a hell of a party. It, yeah. it was an unbelievable party. It's, it's and the, we were there, but as I tell everybody, we're kind of dancing next to the exit. And we've seen this movie before and it and people got carried away. Well, and it's it's a really interesting thing because I believe when you look at those great times, it's really when I have clients say to me, you know, we really don't have to to create anything different because it's we're doing just fine and people are showing up. But but it's really those challenging times that I think some of the best companies are formed, some of the best ideas come out of it. And boy, do we need some creative ideas and, in housing. And, and when your back's against the wall, now you're going to find out who knows how to win. You're going to swim. You're going to swim back. You're going to learn how to win. You're going to reinvent. And you're going to be ready. And as I tell young developers, it's because that's trading land. Mm -hmm. And, you know, during the SNL days, it's pretty crazy. We could buy stuff, you know, 5,000 an acre, six months later, sell for 15,000. You know, it didn't really do much. It was like, this is crazy. But I saw the SNL, but then I saw the crash. So early in my career, I saw Tram McCrow in trouble, Ulick in trouble, Pogue in trouble. And I go, wow, these big, all these great men I looked up to, they can get in trouble. And you've got to be really safe and really conservative in the business. So if you're a young developer today going through the cycle, you ought to count your blessings because you're going to learn there is a cycle. And when times are good, get ready for when times are bad. And and when times are bad, I swear that's when the smartest things happen. Would Hillwood ever consider being a builder? Oh yeah, I talk about it all the time. You should. Oh yeah, no, I keep telling our team, I said we we should be a builder, but then everybody pushes back on it. But I, I just think it's a great time because we just now is the time. Also, we have so many, but our clients are builders. Do I really mm-hmm. want to go compete with these great clients? And that's where we stop. But we do we talk about it. Well, so we talk are... about a lot. 
And there are a lot of master plan developers. I worked for the Irvine company, so Donald mm -hmm. Brand certainly did both of those things. And, and there are great reasons why mm -hmm. to do it. But it also really pushes that innovation factor. The average size home before 1950 was 1,000 square feet. It was just under 1,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. And we had twice the household size. Today, the average square footage is about 2,400. And, and can you be better? I mean, can you push to create something that, frankly, has more function and form? Well, we have to. We have to because our I homes agree. are too expensive. You're right. I mean, our, our Park Glen, our first homes at Park Glen, $85,000 when I got started. Now the average home price is almost three eighty four hundred. dollars It's crazy. But we, we we rocked along for maybe 10 Wilson said maybe 10 years and 180000 was the average before. And that was all. And now they've doubled. So we've got to get a more affordable home for the client base. And, and the industry will reinvent on how to do that. I think it takes somebody with perseverance and push and not the, hey, we've always done it this way, so we're going to continue doing that. And entitlement. Yes. The cities have to let you do it. And that's where you run into a lot of issues. A lot of cities don't want the smaller home. They want the bigger lot. Really? And so you've, that's where you've got a political issue. So I usually hear cities pushing the other way. They talk affordability. about affordability. They want affordability. Right. right. But a lot of the neighborhood groups, they don't want small lots. They don't want the small home. So I, th this is where you have to be creative on how you do it. So we're we're just I do have one last question for you. There it's kind of a twofold mm -hmm. question, and I know I keep saying that. But the where do you think you've made the biggest difference and where do you think you can make the biggest difference uh, going forward? But first, I think we're just warming up. I mean, I, I think love we, that we have a huge amount to do. And we have a huge amount of projects left to do. And so I, I really feel like we've learned a lot, but our biggest programs and our biggest impact is out in front of us. So I think that's good. The biggest you know, economic project by far is Alliance. And it'd be very difficult to duplicate that, 27,000 acres. You know, 530 firms, 63,000 people go to work every day at Alliance. And we're just half done. And so we have mm -hmm. a huge amount of development left at Alliance. So that's the biggest economic impact. As far as the biggest development impact, I think that we've done so far uh, is the Air Force Memorial in Washington. Mm -hmm. For a real estate developer to develop on the mall and develop a project that is in the nation's capital that'll truly be there in perpetuity. But you, you can go to our communities, they'll be there. But the homes that are in our communities today, Hundred years from now, they're torn down. They're redeveloped. Air Force Memorial will not get torn down. I mean, that that is as long as we have a country, that memorial will be there. And that was a huge honor for our team to be able to work on that. That's fantastic. Well, with that, it's it's truly okay. been an honor to meet well, thank you. Thank you. Great talk questions. with you. I just so enjoyed this time and. Uh, Thank you all for joining us uh, for today's series on inspirational leadership. Ross Bro Jr. with with Hillwood, and uh, I can't think of a better interview. So I I just really Thank appreciate you. it. It was a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank so Thank you. Much. Appreciate it. Yes. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you again for joining us today, and a huge thanks to our sponsor, American Ventures. Without them, these podcasts are not possible. Don't forget to subscribe and like today's podcast and please join us again next time.